you take a lactate? No. I'll be fine. <laughs> Told ya. Shut up. Don't give him that. His stomach can't handle it. He'll get sick. Oh, he's a cat. He's fine. Told you. Shut up. You know where I saw this earlier? The bathtub. Oh yeah, I needed to scrub it. Yeah, but I just found it in the sink. I needed to do dishes after. What? It touched soap. If it touched soap, that means it's clean. <gasps> What's up? What's up? You left the toilet seat up. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Just put it down. The gloves are off. <laughs> hey, this is our third message in this, this series, Man versus Wife. And uh, there, there's only been three people make decisions for the Lord during this series, so what might he have in store for you? It's pretty awesome. A couple is going to get baptized next Sunday. Um, today's message is primarily for men. So, so I, I, I want to start out with a, with a few things. Number one is for you ladies. Uh, this right here, since it's for men, it's not a time for you to, to jab your, you know, to get him in the side with his hand. And when you get in the car afterward, you don't point it out and say, did you hear what that preacher said? You know, you don't do that. And uh, I, I don't know of any man who was ever nagged into heaven by his wife. So we just ladies want you just to shh this morning and listen up and bear with us. Number two, scripture defines for us what biblical manhood is, men, and we're going to look at that today, and I hope it's some fun. And, uh, and I want to go ahead and acknowledge that it's tough, and none of you women, none of, none of this, but, but being a man is tough. And number three, I want to say this as your pastor. Everything that I'm teaching today, I have not mastered. Uh, I, I, I don't have an S on my chest. I do not walk on water. I do, ha I do not have this stuff perfected. I'm speaking to you today, men, as a fellow struggler on this journey of manhood. So I'm praying today, men, that, that we can become the men that God has called us to be in the home and in his church. So there's this phrase that I want you all to get today, uh, and that is this phrase, this, no matter what. I want you to be able to look in, in the eyes of your spouse after this today, and have that phrase embedded in your mind, no matter what. So, man, I want, just practice that out loud today with me on the count of three. One, two, three, no matter what. That good? No matter what. I want, I want you to get that today. I mean, no, no matter what, I'm, I'm in this, wife. No matter what, I'm in this to the end. So, so real, real men, guys, don't punt the ball on fourth down. They go for it every time they do that. So there are three commitments, men, that we need to be willing to make. If we're going to be the, the, the spouse that God wants us to be no matter what, and to become the man that God wants us to become. And, and if, you're, if you're single today, you need to be willing to make these three commitments before you enter into marriage. So number one, if you got your outlines, you flip that over. Number one is no matter what you do, no matter what you do, man, we got to be willing to look at our spouse and say to them, no matter what you do, I love you. I always will. So Ephesians chapter 5 today is going to be our text, primary text. And so we're going to open that up right now and read verse 25 of Ephesians chapter 5 where it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So I want to talk about, in fact, in fact if you've got your bulletins, you can circle that just as Christ loved the church. And I want to talk about how Christ has loved the church over the past 2,000 years. Because one of the things I think we could all agree on about the church, the church can be crazy sometimes. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the church is crazy. I mean, everybody who's attended church, everybody's got some crazy church story, right? Just like, you know, what happened to that person. I mean, and when the Bible talks about the church, it's talking about the people in the church. It's just not talking about the building. And for 2,000 years, there's been some crazy things going on. That's why when I go out in a community and I invite people to church, they say, well, I don't go to church because there's just too many hypocrites in the church. And I go, that's why I'm asking you, bro. There's always room for one more, right? Come on in. So I just want to go back into history and just kind of just check out a few of the things that happened in the church. I mean, in our Bibles, we have the history of the church. In the book of Acts in the New Testament, it explains how the church was launched, 
the first many years in the church, and it didn't take very long before the church just went absolutely crazy. You don't even get out of the book of Acts before you read about some crazy things happening because they were preaching the gospel, the, the pre, by, by grace you're saved, faith in Christ is what saves you. And, and when you read through the book of Acts, the response to the gospel is always baptism. A person always gets baptized when they respond to have that cleansing, that washing away of sins. There's these guys that came along in Acts chapter 15, and they said, no, they, they really believed in the law of Moses. They were, they were Jewish, and they, they were like, no, it's, it's not just this baptism thing. You guys have got to get circumcised too. Right there in Acts chapter 15. I mean, that's crazy. The men are going, who cares? Or the women are going, who cares? And the men are going like at the Bible study. Wait a minute. Wait, baptism and circumcision? You know, ooh. I mean, can you believe that? I mean, that's how you enter the church? I mean, some of you guys go, I got to get dunked underwater. You imagine if you had to get circumcised to come in front, of, up in front of the church. What a ceremony would that be? Baptism and circumcision right there. It's like, no, you know, what's, what's up with that? I mean, it's crazy. People went crazy. So there is a new meaning to men's ministry in Scripture, right? The Acts chapter 15, this happened in the church. These guys were demanding that because they just kind of went crazy. Then a thousand years later, the Crusades. The church kind of went crazy during the Crusades. There needed to be war, but the church somehow missed the point in all of that. And, and I don't know if you've ever gotten this, but people go, I don't go to church because, you know, man, the Crusades. It's like, well, the church went crazy. It's like, dude... I wasn't there, you know, we weren't there, we weren't even a part of that, you know, come on. The medieval inquisitions, church went crazy, church went crazy. During the inquisitions, I mean, they would go out and, and light you on fire. Like we have people come to the church, and sometimes some people come five, eight weeks, two months, and they're gone, and they like leave the church, and they don't go anywhere else, we find that out, it's like, they're gone. We call that backslidden or apostate. They leave the church. We put them here. We just kind of put them on the inactive list. Some people say, you know, don't email me anymore. We, you know, we're on the inactive list, you know. And, and that's all. During the inquisitions, if you did that, they would hunt you down and set you on fire. They'd say, you stop going to church? Yeah. Flamethrower. <laughs> call of duty. They torched you. The church went crazy during that time. Crazy. I mean, I remember back when, when I became a Christian. It wasn't that long ago, really, three decades ago. But I came into the church, and there were people talking against rock and roll music during that time. And it's like, you don't listen to that. I mean, these guys taught this, right? And they taught, if you listen to rock and roll, you will start doing LSD, and you'll wake up in the middle of the night and kill your parents. It's like, What? They say, yeah, backward masking. And they would play records, rock and roll records backwards. Did you ever hear them do that? And they'd play that and they would go, if you listen to this, you will kill your parents and take LSD. <laughs> you know, I can't even understand it going forward. And I want to get that message going. But church went crazy doing that stuff. And today, televangelist, you know, send your money in, you're going to get wealthy. You sent your money in, <laughs> you're still broke. It didn't work, right? Church goes crazy sometimes. I'm just saying, if we can all admit, we go crazy sometimes. The church goes crazy. And it goes crazy because we're in it. It's made up with people just like me. But guess what? After 2,000 years, as crazy as the church has gotten, Jesus never forsook his church. Jesus didn't tap out on his church. And even though we've done ridiculous things, Jesus said, you're still my church. He designed it. He organized it. He loves it no matter what. And here's the point that I want us to get, that he loves the church based on our position in the church, not the performance of the church. Because if he loved us based on performance, we'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? But he, it's based on our position as his sons and daughters. And here, here's the point when it comes to, to marriage, men. You're to love your wife based on the position that she has as your spouse, not on her performance as your spouse. You love her no matter what. And it's difficult at times because, now don't say anything out loud, men, but, but wives, they can go crazy sometimes, can't they? Huh? Right. No, no, I'm not supposed to say that out loud. But women admit that today. Don't you just sometimes like go crazy? I mean, just sometimes. I mean, admit that, will you? Like... Like with shoes, right? You try on a pair of shoes at the store and you know they don't fit and they hurt your feet, but oh, they look good and they're on sale. And you buy those shoes and you wear them all day and you're going in your head, these shoes hurt my feet. Why'd you buy the shoes when they didn't fit? 
We go crazy sometimes. Is it necessary, women, to have 14 bottles of shampoo in, 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 in the shower? Is it really? Single guys, you don't get this because I know you may have a bar of soap in there. On some days, you got a bar of soap in there. But women can go crazy with this stuff. Does there have to be 20 pillows on the bed? Who lay, who, who's, you, women, crazy stuff. I got men tell me, you know, Pastor Greg, my wife's crazy. And I go, I know she's crazy. She married you, bro. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, man, we are called to love our wives, just like Christ loved the church, no matter what. G and Jesus never walked away from the church, even when it was at its worst. He loved the church based on position, not performance. And, and, and women, guys, need permission to mess up. They, they need permission to be imperfect, just as the church was imperfect. We need to, to grant them that. And one of the godliest things that we can do today as men of God, is before the end of the day is over, is just to say to our wife, no matter how crazy this relationship get, gets, no matter how low this gets, no matter what happens, I love you to the end. I'm in this forever, no matter what. That's the godliest thing, men, that you might be able to say to your wife today before the day is over. So we love them no matter how crazy it gets. Number two, no matter what it takes, no matter what it takes, verse 25 again, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for the church. You can circle that phrase and he gave himself up for her. We are called men literally to lay down our lives like Christ laid down his life for the church, to lay down our lives for our wives. Men, quick question. Quick question. The remote control in your house, how many of you that remote control is yours? Raise your hand if that remote control is yours. No doubt about that. Now, women, how many men next to you should have raised their hand and didn't? <laughs> yeah, yeah, see? See there? <laughs> in my house, I have supreme authority over the remote control. I do. I have declared that. That is my remote control. And, uh, and my kids have to have written permission before they can touch the thing. It's like, you're not going to touch that. But I come home one day, and my wife's got the remote control. And uh, that's okay, because when I'm not home, you know, somebody, somebody's got to use it. So I've granted her that, that position. But, but I walked in. Yeah, don't throw that, honey. Yeah, I know. I better stick with my notes here. <laughs> um, and I walked in, and she's, she's watching Say Yes to the Dress, right? And some of you women know what I'm talking about. Some of you win men should not know what I'm talking about. And, and, and so I sat down, and, and I grabbed my remote. And I go to change my remote. And she says, honey, what are you doing? And I'm like, babe, I, you know, I'll turn a little news on. Daddy's home. That's my remote. <laughs> she said, well, I thought today that maybe you would have it in your heart to, with all, after all the football games that I've watched with you. It's just to sit here for the next 20 minutes and watch Say Yes to the Dress. <laughs> you know what I did? I, I watched Say Yes to the Dress. <laughs> You know, because I, I want it to go well for me. So I laid down my life. I laid down my life <laughs> for my wife, right? I know, I know. We're called to lay down our life. Jesus went to the cross. I'm like watching say yes to the dress. Do I really want to go to Jesus and compare? Do I really want to do that? We are called men to literally lay down our life before a holy God on this. And if we're going to be more like Jesus, Jesus laid down his life, and we're called to, to lay it down no matter what that is. And I've had men push back, well, my wife won't follow my leadership authority. She just won't follow me. Let me tell you something, man. I've never seen a woman that had a hard time following the leadership of the man when he's totally sold out for Jesus Christ, and he's laying his life down for her. If she has a problem with that kind of leadership, she has a problem with Jesus Christ being Lord of her life and not a problem with you. And I'm telling you, it's just, we've got to lay our life down no matter what on a daily basis for our wife as we seek to follow Jesus Christ. So I wanna to talk to the single guys just for a moment. Guys, uh, I wanna talk about what you can do to lay down your life for your prospective spouse. Single men, you, you, cannot, you cannot pursue Jesus unless you're laying down your life, unless you're following him daily. We've got to follow the authority and say yes to Jesus Christ. So I just want to give you a short list of some things that I think that are common to single men where you can submit to Jesus Christ on a daily basis before 
you get a spouse. Number one, get a job. <laughs> it is not your job to lay around and play video games all day long, unless you work for a video game company, and then it'd be okay. But you don't, you don't, you just don't do that. And why is that important? Why is getting a job important? First Timothy five guys says in scripture that, that it is, it, it, it were to provide for a family and, it, and you're worse than an unbeliever if you're not willing to provide for your family. So, so you get a job. Now I understand that in this economy, if you lost a job, I get that. But if, if you're a single guy and you're living with five other guys just to save rent money so you can lay around and do nothing, that's, that's just not going to cut it. Um, number two, get out of debt. So it takes a job to get out of debt, right? Number three, overcome your lust problem. Guys, don't take the issues with lust into your marriage, thinking marriage is going to cure, cure that. And if you need assistance with that, come to the church for that. Celebrate recovery. We, we got a pro, I mean, handle that beforehand. Because let me tell you something about single and godly women. Single, godly women are not praying this prayer. Dear God, please send me a boy who thinks he's a man, who doesn't have a job and sits around playing video games all day long, and he's in debt. And, and he looks at porn every night. A single girl is not praying that prayer. So let me ask you something. If God gave you a girl today, guys, would she say, thank you, Lord? Or would she pray, why me, Lord? Because of how you're submitting to Jesus Christ today. Because you're never going to lay down your life for your prospective spouse, men, if you're not pursuing Christ daily. It's just not going to happen. For you married men. You're married men. What can we do to lay ourselves down for our spouse? It begins every day by reading the scriptures, praying, and connecting with the heart and the mind and hearing the voice of God in your life. Being a Christian and, oh, I've said a prayer, I'm not going to hell. Being a Christian is waking up every day saying, Lord, how, how, whatever, whatever you say, I'm going to do in my life. And men, we got to fight for that. We live in a culture that is pushing us not to do that at every step, at every corner. So let me just hit a couple of areas I think that are important to married men. Where, where we get a, little, a lot of feedback here at the church. One area, man, where, where we need to submit and learn that is through our finances. When I preach on generosity, on tithing, on, on giving, 90% of the pushback that we get on that is, is from men. 90%. Not women, but men. What's the deal with that? Well, because if I preached a message like, you deserve that truck, I wouldn't get any feed, any pushback on that, would I? Or, or, or go buy that driver. God wants me to have that boat. These are sermon titles. Climb a tree, kill a deer, love Jesus, buy a hunting rival. If I preach, I mean, we'd love that stuff. Wouldn't men just love that? Men, when it's, it's, when it's about spending money on your habits and your hobbies, it's awesome. But when we talk about putting Jesus first in our finances, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, a little too personal here. 90% of the complaints are from men. And men, listen to me, it's a heart issue. I don't believe it's a heart issue, Greg. Yeah, you will one day. You will one day because God calls us men to put him first in our finances. Second area, men, leading your family and bringing them to church during corporate worship. In America today, it is, it's men would rather take their kids to, to sports than, than they would to bring them to church on a regular basis. And I'm all about sports, guys. I'm all about that. But what I'm saying, dads, is where do you want your son or daughter to be in 10 years spiritually? Where do you want them to be in their walk with Jesus Christ? And what are you doing right now to get them there? Because we have parents, we've, we've got dads that bring in their teenage sons, that bring in their teenage daughters when, when they are running from God, and they set them down thinking that the church is going to fix it. And, and, and I hate to tell them this, and, and I go, I, I can't fix your son or daughter. You know, only Jesus Christ is going to fix your son or daughter. And this recognition of sadness comes in her eyes. I should have had them here 10 years ago. What are you doing right now, dads? to do that. Men, you're called to lead your family spiritually. And the idea that we can do that apart from the local church, we just, 2,000 years of church history, 66 books in the Bible to tell us that, that if, if you don't think the local church is important, you're believing the lie of the devil. Because church is important. 
And bringing your family, leading your family spiritually, no matter what, is of most importance. Who do you think, men, God's going to co- hold accountable in your family for, for your family not being led spiritually? Who do you think that's going to be? Is it going to be the, the, the man or the woman? It's going to be us, men. That's the weight of the world that, he, that God has placed on our shoulders. You remember the story in Genesis chapter 3 about Adam and Eve sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G? You remember that story? It was a cool story, wasn't it? Well, wasn't it fun to learn about that? Eve walks out into the garden, and there's this snake there, and she starts having a conversation with the snake. Number one, you never have a conversation with a snake, right? And number two, if you ever see a snake in the garden, you kill it right You kill it because, is there any good snake? Oh, there's good snakes, preacher. My stepdad said, the only good snake is a dead snake. And and I follow that. I I practice that. In Genesis chapter 3, Eve goes out, right? Adam's there the whole time. And she goes out and she sees the fruit. Adam's like hanging out right there with her. And and she sees the fruit. She handles the fruit. And and who's, who's the first person to taste the fruit, man? Yeah, it's not Jesus, I know. Jesus is usually the answer, but it's Eve. Eve was the first one to sin here. She was the first one to handle it. But, uh, and it's like, you know, men, we can blame, tend to blame women and blame Eve for eating that fruit. And, but we really can't do that because Adam needed Eve, right? Because he'd got lost in that garden because he wouldn't have had anybody to ask for directions if she hadn't been there. But Eve, understand this, Eve handled the fruit. She, she saw it, she tasted it, she had that conversation with, with that steak, and she ate it. But who do you think God held responsible for that, man? Who do you think God held responsible for that? Look, in, in, uh, in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible reads this in verse 8. It says, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I mean, they ate the fruit, they had sinned, and they tried to hide from God. And it, but I, I grew up watching Bugs Bunny, and this coyote in this Bugs Bunny show would like, like all of a sudden this boulder's getting ready to fall on, on his head, and he holds up this little tiny umbrella like that's going to save him. Squish, it flattens. And some of you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. Do they still play Bugs Bunny and the flattening of the coyote? I mean, they show zombies getting stabbed by butter knives. I'm thinking maybe they've taken Bugs Bunny off or something like that. This is like what we do with God. We like, we like sin or we're not responsible. We're like holding up that little umbrella going, God can't see me. Nope, it's not my fault, God. It's not my fault. Look what verse 9 says. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? God called to the man, men, where are you? Eve first saw the fruit. She handled the fruit. She ate the fruit. She gave it to Adam. And who did God call on the carpet being spiritually responsible for that family, that union? He called the man as responsible. Men, we're going to be held accountable for how we spiritually lead our families. And, be, and before I move on, I, I know I, I get this. Well, that's easy for you, Greg. It's, you're, you're the pastor, man. It's easy for you to lead your family. And let me explain that a little bit. I can get up here and I can talk about Scripture. And I can talk about... A lot of personal things, too, a lot of edgy things, because Scripture's edgy. If you ever read that, you know what I'm saying? But, but let me tell you, one of the most awkward things that I do in life is to spiritually lead my family, and want, primarily praying with my family. That's one of the most awkward things that I do. But I pray with my family primarily at mealtimes and at nighttime, right? And, and, and at mealtime, we pray. I mean, we, we pray. I start, we go all the way around the room, and sometimes that can be awkward. Why is that awkward? Because they know me. They see me, Pastor Gray, at his worst, right? But, but I, I force myself to do that anyway, and I pray, and, it, and it's awesome. Sometimes it's kind of weird, though, because the kids kind of mimic the prayers of, of Dad. But, but we go around the room, and we pray, and we pray for each other. We pray that we would follow Jesus every day, that the kids would follow Jesus all the days of their life. We pray for you guys. We pray for, for, for some things specifically. We, we pray about God's church, our, our impact on the community. We pray about all of that. And let me tell you, it's awkward. I pray with my wife at, at nighttime, every night, and that can be awkward, especially right after a fight. Lord God, please be with Denise. She has sinned a while ago. 
You know, it just doesn't go too well when we're lying. But, but it's awkward. Let me tell you something. Your child men will never forget daddy praying with them. They won't. Men, your wives will never forget you praying for them specifically about how much you love them no matter what, no matter how the day went. They will never forget that. Jesus laid down his life on the cross, and we're called as husbands to lay our lives down for our wives, guys, for our families. Point three, no matter what you need, no matter what you need. I said in my introduction today that, <clears throat> that it, it, it's hard being a man sometimes. It, it is. It's difficult. Like one time, <laughs> a, a while back, I mean, this is when we had a lot of rain going on. <clears throat> I lying in bed, it's probably about 12, 1230 at night. And uh, I, some, I, I'm a light sleeper. And uh, I was awakened to this noise. And I hopped up with a prayer. What do you mean hopped up with a prayer preacher? Well, I call the 40 Glock that sleeps right beside me, my prayer. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, what's that noise? There was scratching, amen. What? There was scratching, the scratching sound coming from the ceiling fan. And I'm listening, Denise wakes up. It's like, what is that? It's mice, right? I had to go out in the middle of the night, into the garage, put up the ladder, crawl through that hole, walk all the way to the edge through all this stuff, this, this insulation, to set traps. I came back down, huffing and puffing, stuff all over me. I go to crawl back in bed, and, and I still heard scratching. I wanted to take my prayer and just pray him away. Boom, 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 right there. <laughs> but I didn't do that. It's tough, isn't it, being a man? Isn't it tough? You got, I hear you guys like weeping for me right now. <laughs> a, a couple Last week, you know, I wake up. There's like a foot of snow dumped. On, on, our, on our house. And I look out at the sidewalk in the driveway and I go like, somebody ought to do something about that. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's me, right? And then it happened this morning. It's like, the heck with that. I'm coming to church. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. It's hard sometimes. It is. It's hard being a man. Uh, I want to read for you the rest, of, the rest of these verses from Ephesians here, starting with verse 26. It goes on to say, you know, husbands love your wives to, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the words. And guys, our words are so important, what we say to and about our wives, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And in the, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Hear that, guys? He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body. But he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. We are to care for our wives, men, no matter what they need. And we've got that responsibility to, to care for them, because when we're caring for them, we're caring for ourselves. Because the Bible says the two become one. Now, I want to read another verse out of, uh, I want to read it out of the, the English Standard Version. I usually read out of the NIV, but let me just read it from my sheet here because I, I like the way that it presents it here. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says it like this. It says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Men, biblically, we are called to understand our wives because I get men, I don't understand that woman. I know she's a woman. We won't ever understand her. She doesn't understand herself sometimes. But we are called to be a student of her mate and to learn. If we're constantly trying to understand her, the marriage will never be boring. But we, we learn and we love no matter what in our marriage. And I've got men go, well, my wife doesn't understand me. What's there to understand, bro? We're simple. Men are simple, right? Food, sleep, sex. Sleep, food, sex. Sex. Sleep food. Did I just not sum up every man in this place? <laughs> men, women aren't biblically called to understand us, but we're called to biblically understand them. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel. Women, don't get mad at that. I'm not a weak vessel. No, I, I think in a minute we'll understand what the Bible's talking about just a little bit better. And, and I mean, I get the Virginia Slims thing. You come a long way, baby. I know that. W women are strong today. But, but it's saying, I mean, if we were to, 
get down and do bench presses, the men are just going to be stronger than, than you guys, women. It's, I, mean, 90, I mean, there's some exceptions, but 90% of the time, the man's going to be able to out bench press his wife. You know, that's just the weaker vessel that way. But, but it actually says something important summing up this verse. Look, un, and an, live with her in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. If we don't honor our wives, guys, our relationship with God is going to be severed. I mean, our prayers are going to be hindered if we do that. So we're called to show our wives honor. We're supposed to show them honor. So, so I want to illustrate this point by this drum and this vase. This drum, guys, this drum, 55-gallon drum, this is you, right? This is you. When, when I grew up, when I was a kid, I had a pump BB gun, and I'd go around and I'd shoot stuff like this. And I'd throw rocks at stuff like this. I'd hit stuff like this. The drums are tough. You know, they can take a ton of abuse. And probably every man in this room, uh, like I want to do with Jim, talking about not taking communion after this, we could get in a fight, and we could cuss each other upside down one the other. Five minutes later, we go, hey, dude, sorry. I'm sorry, too. Go to McDonald's. Best of friends, right? Best of friends. Best of <laughs> two, women, two women get in a fight like that. 15 years later, it might be okay. 15 years later. Well, I'm just saying women need more time to process this stuff. I mean, so men, you get in an argument with your wife and you say, I'm sorry. And you, you want it to be okay right now because men, we can do that. But, but men, it's never okay immediately because they need time to process that stuff because cause we're drunk. And, and women, you're a vase, right? And I think I can make the argument that that drum's a little stronger than this vase, right? But I could make an argument that this vase is more valuable than that drum, right? I mean, but if we shot this with a BB gun, we wouldn't expect this thing to hold up like that drum would. We wouldn't. But I think I can make an argument with you that this is more valuable and more precious. And this needs to be treated with respect, men. And you need to hold this vase close to you, men, because that's how God designed us. And women, you are this vase. Men, you are that drum. And we need to understand what the scripture is telling us as being men of God. That while we can handle a lot, that we are to treat this base of our spouse with the utmost. And we put it on a pedestal. And we care for that. And let me tell you, there's not a woman in the world, guys, who wouldn't love that. And that's what we're called to do. Now, women, I told you at the beginning of the message that I wanted you to be like, shh, a little bit, you know, during the message. But I want to say this specifically to you right now because we said a lot and I know there are some women here today and, and I know there are women who say I've been divorced I know I messed up I know I made some mistakes I'm not worthy of Jesus let me tell you something you're like this face in Jesus Christ you're precious you're valuable and God wants you to know just standing alone how precious you are I know there's women who's like I've had such a sexual past I've had things done to me I'm not worthy but in Christ in Christ he transforms you and it's not because of past performance that he loves you it's because of your position in Jesus Christ ladies that he loves you no matter what Jesus Christ loves you and he holds you here and he wants you to know today that you are absolutely precious in his sight no matter what. So what I want to wrap up with today, no matter what you've done, no matter what's happened to us, no matter what, Jesus loves us when we're in Christ based on our position as Him, as His sons and daughters. And here's what I believe. I believe there are some people here today that we need to pray through the commitments that we just listed some of you men especially, some of you women need to understand that 
It's Jesus Christ that makes you totally complete, totally whole. And we need to hear today God's voice saying, it's time for you to submit to me. So let's pray that prayer right now. All eyes closed, every, every head bowed. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you, God, will speak to our hearts, that you have spoken to our hearts. And men, particularly, you need to pray some of these things, no matter what they do, no matter what they need, no matter what it takes. And some of you, when you get home today, you've you got to look at your wife and just say, I'm in this forever, no matter what. I want to honor you as a, a valued vessel of of Jesus Christ, not a drum. And some of you guys, frankly, need to give some stuff up in order to draw your family to Jesus Christ spiritually. And ladies, some of you need to just pray, Jesus, help me. Help me to see that I am that face and I'm not that drum because Satan keeps pulling up those, those words in my mind. Because in Jesus, he makes you the valued vessel that you are. And I know there are people here today, this has been a, a marriage message on marriage and, and godly men, but, but that, that, those aren't your problems. You just have basically a Jesus problem because you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. There's never been a time that, that you have said, God, all of me for all of you. So my question today is, have you completely surrendered to him? So if you want to surrender your life to Jesus, but you're like, you know, I've been too bad. I know I've messed up too much. Understand that Jesus is too good. And he's laid down his life already to prepare the way to make you holy and blameless and pure, just like scripture says. So if you want to surrender your life today to Jesus, just pray right there where you are in your heart and say, dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need forgiveness. I believe you laid down your life on that cross. You rose from the grave. Right now, I just surrender to that. I confess your Lord. Please come into my life and show me how to live. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you just prayed that prayer, what I'm asking you to do is for you to tell somebody. There are going to be people uh, in a little bit in the lobby, our care team. Let them know. Tell them. And if you, need, if you heard something today where you need to pray about this message, they're willing to pray with you or for you. When we sing in just a moment, we're going to have the opportunity just to make our way out there to pray with these people. Father, I pray that we will have heard your voice right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me right now? If you love Jesus, would you give him a big hand clap right now? If you love Jesus. Last week I, I talked about our homework, our homework assignment, and that was out of Ephesians or Philippians chapter 2. Our homework assignment for this week every day is to read Ephesians, what we read today, Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33. And also this first Peter chapter three, the first seven verses of that as your homework. And, and you listen to Jesus this week. Um, it's awesome that you guys came out to worship the Lord today. Let us just go out with the love of Jesus into this community and, and tell them about what we celebrate. And let's see what, come back next week and let's see what God can do to further our cause for him, right? Let's sing.